1990, Leo Givas. I first met him in the summer of 88, and I spent a couple weeks at Deck Cirque working together on some problems that became part of his thesis. Um, he has uh, worked on the, or served on the steering committee for ACM SOCG, and he also designed and printed a shirt that I like to wear, especially to events like this. Uh, when he hosted ACM Sausage at UBC, uh, and he likes to describe his research as elliptical, uh, dividing his time between practice and theory, and he hopes that you don't find it hyperbolic. All right. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, I hope you don't find it unconnected to uh, informal mapping as well. But, um, so I thought I'd better say why, I'm, why I got invited here, uh, for which I, I thank the organizers. Um, and I think it was because uh, I heard uh, from Marshall Burns a conjecture from Steve and, and uh, Tofen uh, about the Bristol and the Vasa CRDT algorithm, uh, where they had uh, uh, whether you could determine polygons by giving, being given a triangulation of polygons or combinatorial, which really seems to connected by diagonals. And you were also given the internal angles of the polygon, and you were given cross ratios of, of these edges. And whether that uniquely determined the polygon was um, something that was a, a theoretical curiosity that came up in an algorithm in which uh, they had a, a solution for, uh, but they just wanted to make sure things always worked. Um, I find myself in a similar situation today because I, one of the things I want to talk about, we have a solution for, and I want to prove that it always works. Uh, so I hope that uh, uh, some of you will be able to help me with this. Um, let's see. So, uh, and, you know, the, the so what I want, you know, I could talk about old stuff, about conformal mapping, but uh, I wanted to talk about some new stuff that isn't as close, isn't, very closely tied to conformal mapping at all. Uh, and you'll find, I think this is true of most of the computational geometers that are here. We're, we're talking about things at the interface, things where we're trying to have connections. And part of that is to figure out what it is that we're working on that, that does connect and, and uh, start the dialogue. So I wanted to say a little bit about some of the things that I'm working on uh, before I actually launch into the talk, give you a little bit more context. One of the things that I like dealing with is triangulations, which is why the, the uh, uh, problem from the CRDT algorithm to do it. One of the things I try to deal with is in computational geometry is problems where most people think that the solution is just put down a grid, make things easy for the computer to do computation on, on data that's very regular. But you know, um, especially in things like the map making that Alan Salfeld was talking about, the standard is you know just put down a, a, a regular grid, uh, assign every plot of ground uh, you know to be a square, and assign the value to that square by just putting a number in the grid. Um, here's data that I got recently from uh, Rob Anderson and. Uh, um, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, formerly National Imagery Mapping Agency, uh, 36 million points from, from sonar tracks where they you know, drag some sonar uh, equipment behind the ship and the ship goes and travels all over the place. And uh, it's clear that there are some areas uh, in this that are uh, uh, more interest than others. Uh, there's, there's great density in the data along here. There's some strange things where you go up and spin the ship around here. There's actually a huge amount of data in this area. It's much more sparse over here. And since it's a ship, it's not surprising that uh, over here we're looking at shallow areas. Here there's the cliff. There's a sea mount down here that they don't want a submarine to run into. If they, uh, and so they need mapping uh, information, different amounts of information at different locations. And the sort of data that they've collected sort of says to us something about how much they're interested in different features. And we'd like some, some way of making, doing maps, now cartographic maps, that the amount of information sort of has to reflect the interest. And there's this, I think Ken mentioned in his 
first talk about some, some sort of consistency that we, if we want to have as we do this mapping. You know, I'm using mapping in two different senses to try to you know, stretch a connection, not intentionally, not that I didn't mean to do that. But the, uh, there, there's some sort of consistency going on, yet we are interested in different levels of detail in different areas, which would be pictures of the conformal mappings of disks, uh, and so the discrete conformal mappings very much had this feel to me. It's sort of, in some ways, an inverse type of the problem. So I'll show some other pictures of this. Um, I like working on these things in the, in the data as it comes, so uh, screens of very unstructured data. And uh, one of the recent works with a PhD student of mine, who also done a PhD uh, and a former PhD student of mine, Martin Eisenberg, um, PhD student is, is uh, Yuan Shin Liu, who's uh, also uh, the work that I'm going to be mostly talking about. Look at handling very large unstructured data sets and building triangulations for them and delaying triangulations for them, including things like. Uh, This is still the introduction, so I can show a bit of a movie of where you know, we take data, for example, from uh, a laser rangefinder and fly low flying aircraft with laser rangefinder to get elevation maps to manage make floodplain maps. This is the entire News River Basin, which basically gives us uh, half a billion points, gives us a billion triangles. We do this on laptops. Uh, not in five seconds, I'm afraid, but in about uh, 20 minutes uh, on the laptop, which is um, something that most people don't do. And, uh, and, and so this gives us some, um, some audacity, or you know, at least an edge, when we try to approach problems where we want to use the unstructured data directly for as long as possible before going to some sort of structured grid or some representation We'd like to have a representation that varies uh, at a level of interest. All right, so that's a bit of introduction uh, as to what type of problems uh, I, I like to try to look at and what types of data. Um, the talk is work with my PhD student, Ron Shinryo, where we're looking at uh, centroid triangulations uh, for bivariate piece lines. Um, but and these sort of collaborative, you know, interdisciplinary things fostering collaboration, sometimes it's very difficult to give a talk so that everybody gets something out of the talk. And, and so I thought I should, you know, before I really began, I should say something that, you know, mathematicians can carry something away. Now, if I start out with a physicist, an engineer, and a mathematician, you know how this goes. So there's three different ways that this will go. There's always some sort of joke. Uh, that the, sorry, the mathematicians always get the short end of the stick, at least everybody else thinks so. So um, I guess mathematicians may not think they're getting the short end of the stick when they talk about reducing the previous problems and that's sort of the usual punchline because it's efficient, right? And that's what mathematicians do. Um, but it, I thought uh, I, a lot of people, I, I think, don't know this one about how other disciplines would prove the theorem. Um, I don't know. Raise your hand if you know this one. Okay, so a uh, few people. So, so you guys aren't going to get anything out of this talk at all. <laughs> the rest of you will at least have this to remember. <laughs> so how other disciplines prove all our numbers greater than two are prime? Uh, this is something I saw in Los Angeles Museum of Science and Technology about 1985. And it's I've seen, seen it printed in is the intelligence of um, So just a couple of the scientific and engineering disciplines, what, what does a physicist do? So a physicist approaches this and says, well, three is prime, five is prime, seven is prime, nine is not prime. But 11 is prime, 13 is prime, nine must have been experimental error. All I remember saying that. <laughs> the chemist says, three is prime, five is prime, seven is prime, that's enough data. All our numbers are prime. The engineer says, 3 is prime, 5 is prime, 7 is prime, 9 is prime, 11 is prime, 13 is prime, 13 is prime, 7 is prime. And the uh, Halley Museum didn't say what the computer scientists did, but I know, I know that one. One is prime, one is prime, one is prime. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, now I'll start. How much time do I have? Again, I want to you know I'll start with sort of not a mathematical motivating question, but the motivating question from the sort of applications when I come and talk to the computer scientists and, and sort of applied mathematics people that, that uh, I come and talk to. In computational geometry, we know a lot about building piecewise linear surfaces, so people in computer graphics know a lot about building piecewise linear surfaces by building some sort of triangulated mesh. We can even do this from the irregularly uh, spaced data points. And, uh, but what about making smooth surfaces if we start with irregular data points? In computer-aided geometric design, they know a lot about splines and V-splines. Uh, you can make uh, you know, smooth V-splines from your regular points along the real line. How do you make bivariate splines? A bivariate ver version of these splines And uh, a possible answer is some um, centroid triangulations, which is a generalization of higher order Voronoi rules. And because enough people have mentioned Voronoi, uh, I feel in some sense of to do so. so I'm going to say a little bit more about Borna. Actually, so here's, I've given you a lot of the context and most of the motivation. One other piece of motivation is if you're trying to blend patches together, I'll get to that at the end of the talk, uh, like the teapot uh, spout, where you know, the spout joins the body. The body is a nice regular structure. The spout can be uh, modeled as a nice regular structure, and you have to do something if you're in computer-aided geometric design, to join the, the, the teapot and the body in, in a way that would uh, ideally be smooth where you want it to be smooth. Uh, introduce the, the discontinuities that you want when you, when you need them. So background concepts, I'll just remind you a little bit about uh, these lines, uh, maybe say something about simplex lines. But the main thing I want to say about is uh, uh, Mike Neantu, this is in mathematics of Vanderbilt, as the, uh, the construction of a bivariate least one from higher order to any configurations. And this is really going to, to be what uh, Motivon leads us. Because what I'm going to do is we're going to um, look at generalizing an algorithm to compute the higher order to any triangulations and show how that generalizes uh, the Yantu's constructions. Um, and so these will be the centroid triangulations, which will allow us to build uh, the bivariate east lines in a way that is sort of what I want. I mean, in a way that allows me to have, um, let's have the data determine the level of interest in, in, in three different places. And um, one application, a quick application of blending uh, and some open problems. Uh, so, uh, uh, east lines. The graphics people in here will you know what these lines are. Uh, probably all of the mathematicians have seen the splines are just piecewise polynomials. Terminology is defined on a set of knots. You define them on the real line. Um, for many types of splines, you will use regularly spaced knots, but the spline, for example, can be uh, defined on irregularly spaced knots. You make a B spline space, it's just a linear combination of basis functions. You pick a degree for your polynomials, if you're going to get a degree zero, then you're going to take uh, the degree k in general, you're going to take a consecutive sequence of uh, k plus one knots along the line. You're going to define a piecewise uh, polynomial uh, on, those, uh, on those knots as your basis function that's going to be uh, one well, that these things will be a partition of unity. Uh, and you'll make a spline space by just taking linear combinations of these basis functions. Uh, the properties that you get from univariate least splines is that uh, you get local support by just taking intervals of knots. You get optimal smoothness, but you can reproduce, uh, or, you know, uh, smoothness of order k for the degree k polynomials. Uh, your basis functions are partition of unity, which is saying you can reproduce constants. Uh, and basically, in general, uh, for degree k polynomial, you can reproduce you can reproduce all degree k polynomials if your basis is degree k. Um, you can just write down a form that that will reproduce this expression. So what if, if so if I want a multivariate version of this, what do I want? I mean, 
first of all, we can look at standard things. Uh, there's a lot of uh, what the computer-aided geometric design people will call tensor product constructions, where you'll just you'll just uh, make a spline on the x-coordinates and a spline on the y-coordinates, and that's your multivariate spline. Uh, of course, your set of knots is then the Cartesian product with the knots and the x-coordinates and the knots and the y-coordinates, not a pretty general uh, way of doing this sort of construction. There are subdivision surfaces used in computer graphics. Um, there are block splines, which are um, uh, which will come up again later. Uh, but that these are things that are defined on um, the regular uh, grids. And let's see. things that I want. I, mean, I basically want these properties from the multivariate spline. First of all, I want to be able to use irregular data points because that's what my applications give me. That's what my bias is. That's what you know some of the tools that I have that other people don't have. And so if I want to do something, I want to do it uh, through the regular data points. But then I want something that on those irregular data points gives me local support, optimal smoothness, and efficient ability and production. Uh, for building a spline space. And uh, the, the, the techniques that come closest of the existing techniques to meeting all of those goals on irregular data points uh, are all based on simplex splines, uh, which is uh, uh, a spline formulation of Carl de Boer from 1976, uh, which are just basically degree k polynomials defined on a set of k plus s plus 1 points in Rs in the following fairly simple way. Um, just take your set of points and lift them uh, from Rs to R of Kss. Sort of arbitrarily. And uh, in this dimension, when you take the convex hull, they define a simplex. And now you're going to take slices of this simplex to define your, uh, your, uh, your simplex spline. So if I want to define uh, a function uh, m of x relative to this set of points that I'm given uh, capital X, uh, let's just, to be concrete, let's uh, think of an example where k equals 1, and uh, so a piecewise linear function, s equals 2, that is defined on the domain of the plane, and I will take then uh, four points, lift them up into three dimensions, take the convex hull, which is a tetrahedron, and then to define uh, a function on the plane, I'll pick a point on the plane, look at the measure, the relative measure of the line segment that pierces the simplex relative to the volume of the simplex, and that will be my function. So if I have a simplex that looks something like this one, on the plane, that will get something, a function that is zero outside the convex hull of the uh, points, and it will be a piecewise linear function inside the convex hull of the points. If I, uh, if I take uh, k equals 2 and s equals 1, that is, I want a piecewise quadratic function on uh, the real line, then I take the same simplex, but now I take slices that are plane slices, and take the relative measure of that plane slice divided by the volume and I get a piecewise quadratic as the slice passes through. How do you, oh, oh sorry. As, yeah, so my slice is going to. one dimensional on the bottom, so I can ask how you define which plane, but I yeah. can see now. It's, yeah, it's, a function of, it's a function of the, uh, the x on my real line. Uh, and the fact that I just divide by the volume of the simplex uh, takes out any effects of which simplex I actually live to. So this is a, just a. a portion of uh, determinants, uh, it turns out to be a simple uh, 
So this is a simplex. The simplex spline as a basis function is a polynomial of the appropriate degree and uh, has the right smoothness properties with, uh, sorry, one caveat. So it has local support. It's supported only on the convex hull. That's easy to see because I'm slicing the simplex. If I you know, slice it outside the convex hull, I get zero. Um, it's optimally smooth, uh, assuming that the points are in general position. Now I want to you know, claim that this is a, a, a feature and not a bug. Uh, a feature is a bug as described by the marketing department. Um, it's a feature because you, um, you know, just as you know, people that are familiar with splines know that you put in multiple knots at, at points in order to change the uh, continuity at, at, at points. Uh, so if you wanted to, uh, have to actually pass through a point, then you just put multiple knots there and increase the weight, essentially, of, of that point. Uh, if you want to introduce corners or something like that, you add multiple knots. And the analog in a multivariate spline would be, well, you can add multiple knots, or you can also put in other degeneracies like collinearities, and you can get uh, uh, places where either the function is discontinuous, and discontinuous, uh, yeah, discontinuous by the uh, function discontinuity or um, uh, or derivative discontinuity by putting in these codes and errors. All right. So here's the slide that I wanted to show earlier. So what are multivariate these lines? Uh, well, if we're going to use the simplex spline as a basis, which is what the sort of standard uh, techniques do, Dominic and Shelley uh, uh, with uh, Seidel and Yantu, um, then the task of building uh, bivariate beast lines or multivariate beast lines becomes choosing the right configurations, the right tuples of points that we're going to lift and, and make the simplex lines. And so Domino Michelli in 1983 said, well, just choose all k tuples and make splines for everything, and that's too many. Um, they later said, well, okay, let's make uh, something where we make tuples by taking some of the points and putting them multiple times, and we can get by with fewer tuples, and if we're careful, we can still get the, the smoothness. That's too much work. I want things to be automatic, and it's also sort of, you know, it's sort of uh, duplicating some points and not duplicating others. And now Neantu's idea, which I want to spend some time on, is let's look at Delaney configurations. So Neantu says, uh, so, first of all, we define that the degree k Delaunay configuration, consisting of a triangle and some points that uh, a set i, uh, it's defined by a circle that is a circumcircle of the triangle T and contains all points i in some. And it's k if the, let's see, what do I want? If k is going to be the number of points inside? Uh, yes, k is the number of points inside. Um, so, for example, uh, in this picture that I have here, uh, we can look at a couple of the uh, one, uh, configurations, such as uh, AEF would be this triangle here, uh, the circle that I've drawn that's drawn solid, and B and C are the two points inside. If I sort of push this circle over, uh, I drop off A, eventually I'm going to hit D, and so I get the DEF as the triangle with B and C remaining. And if I push further, I eventually hit B. Uh, D goes inside, uh, and then when I hit B, I have my triangle B we have with C and B inside. So those are examples of the own configuration. Uh, the Amtu's uh, theorem is that we get a spline space if you use these configurations. Well, we, sorry, you get a spline space if you use these configurations. What, what properties does the spline space have? Well, it has the local support and the, um, uh, the um, smoothness properties just from the spline. And the interesting ones are uh, partition of unity and polynomial reproduction. And he proved that you get both of those. That you get the interesting one is polynomial reproduction using this as a basis. So this says that there's a way of making smooth things based on these Delaunay triangles that are sort of this order K Deloney, sorry, I call them Deloney triangles, but it's sort of, it's not what we would think of as Deloney triangles because these triangles are overlapping as you can already see in this picture here. 
I want to give a, a, a different look at those, and for that I want to remind people what uh, Voronoi diagrams are. So the classic Voronoi diagram, and I've decided I should pick the most classic one that I can find, which is this uh, 1664 uh, uh, picture of the Picard. Voronoi and Voronoi were both uh, writing papers of the uh, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, this is just the diagram where you're given a set of points in the plane. Everybody knows this diagram, right? You're given a set of points in the plane. You uh, call these sites. For every other point in the space, you uh, assign it to the closest site, label it with the names of the closest sites, is the way we usually like to say it. And you get a, a partition into uh, regions that are close to one site, regions that are close to two, regions that are close to three or more sites. That correspond to a set of triangles. If you look at the dual, uh, the graph here in a dual of this, of this subdivision is going to have an edge uh, that corresponds to each one of these boring line edges. Uh, it's going to have a triangle that corresponds to the, uh, the vertex here. It's, uh, it's uh, equidistant from three sides. And so the circumcircle of this triangle shows where the center, uh, the, the center of the circumcircle shows the Voronoi site, uh, the point that is equidistant to the three. And, uh, and you get this, this nice triangulation or the nice Voronoi tessellation uh, that, that you draw. Triangulation is only, of course, under the assumption that you have no four points per circular. So you randomly perturb things to, to, to avoid this or uh, so you sweep it under the rug if you're giving a talk. Just assume that things are kind of but uh, well, we do come back to this. That's the order one, the classical Voronoi diagram. Uh, everybody knows their closest neighbor. All right, now label things with their two closest neighbors. And let's partition the plane into uh, regions, maximal regions, that have the same label. We're doing the same thing here. This is the order two board on diagram. And uh, we get regions um, such as this one, where you have the same, <coughs> all of these points in this region have the same two closest neighbors. You get edges, which are again pieces of bisectors of the point of the sites, because uh, this is the, the line uh, that you, as you cross this line, you go from these two closest neighbors to these two closest neighbors. And you get uh, 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 vertices. So here's one where you have, you're equidistant from three points. This is actually the same vertex that we had in the Voronoi diagram just a moment ago. And here is, if you walk up, up in this direction, uh, allow the circle to get a little bit larger, because you have these two as your closest neighbors. So I'm walking into the cell that has the, the two closest neighbors that I indicated earlier. Uh, if I walk this direction, then, then these two become my two closest neighbors. There's another type of vertex here. Um, so, so these were, this one and this one were vertices of the Voronoi diagram that I had on the previous slide. Um, but there's another type, uh, so I need to label some things so that you can see things a little bit. Um, and that's this type. So this is the center of the circle through A, B, and F that has E inside. And uh, this is one where if I go this way, I get B goes inside, but A and F will stay outside. Uh, my closest neighbors in this cell are going to be B and E. In this direction, they're going to be A and B and F. So this, this circle is slightly different uh, from the circles uh, here. In this circle, I walk this way, and I will get A and E by having the circle include two new points. Uh, and the other one already has one point, and so I want only one new point. Um, this is known to the computational geometers for, for a while. Uh, BTV observed in uh, 82, uh, an algorithm that he, uh, that he was constructing that we'll look at in a second that an order cable in our diagram has these two types of vertices close and far, corresponding to circles of K one side and K minus two points inside. And um, Arnhammer gave a nice way of looking at this using the lifting map that, yes? Uh, 
I just, I'm sorry, uh, just to absorb it a little better. I mean, yeah. that isn't a, a boundary effect. That can be deep inside. You can have these. Well, no, this is not a boundary effect at all. This is. So uh, what, did, what did you say with the K minus two points inside of your example? Uh, so, um, yes. So, so for my K, where I'm looking for configurations, in this case, I'd be looking for configurations with points inside. All right? So, um, so let me, uh, um, there's two types of, of vertices in this diagram. There's the type that came through from the order one Voronoi, which have no points inside and three points on the on the boundary. And I can get from one of those to have two points inside by just walking into the neighboring cell and having my circle enclosed two. Okay? And this is the other type where I already have one, and now when I walk into the neighboring cell, I'm only going to get one more to get my two. So here my k equals two, and I've got either uh, one inside or zero inside. Okay. All right. There's a nice uh, uh, lifting map, uh, convex hull version of this, uh, related to the liftings that, uh, that David uh, was talking about in this talk. Um, let me, uh, uh, yeah, so if you try to do the one in triangles for this, the Wani triangulation that we get from the order one Voronoi diagram is, 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 a, is a nice picture because you just take the convex hull of all of the triples that correspond to Voronoi vertices and you get a triangulation of the plane. Here I can do that. I can you know, look at all of these triangles, but they start overlapping. I've got these two different types. I've got the green ones and the blue ones corresponding to the two different types. But there's a nice way of transforming these that actually gives us a nice triangulation where the blue and the green ones and uh, this is the following. Uh, from my original point, what I'm going to do is just construct the midpoints. Construct all midpoints. In general, you could take all k tuples. This is what Arnhammer did in, in 91. Take all k tuples of points. Just take the, uh, the centroid. And then lift these onto the, unit, the paraboloid of revolution. Actually, do that the other way around. Take all your points, lift them onto the paraboloid of revolution, then take the centroids, and then take the convex hull. What you get is, is this. Uh, you know, this nice picture of the convex hull, like, like uh, David was rolling around before. Um, that's defined so that each one of these points has labels. Uh, in this case, uh, this, so this was A and B. This is going to be point A, B. Uh, this is C. And you can get two different types of triangles out of this by depend, depending on what the labels are. Whether the union of the uh, labels around the triangle actually have k things or k plus one things. Let me say a little bit more about that. Um, there's two ways to get this. One is Arn Hammers, and then there's more recently been work by Schmidt and Andre about um, computing these directly, sort of mapping the drawing configurations to, to some sort of triangle. So there's an algorithm by DT Lee for computing these higher order Voronoi diagrams, which we can look at as computing this higher order Voronoi triangle. Okay, and DT Lee's algorithm is, is fairly simple. Um, it says if you want a higher order Voronoi diagram, you compute, you know, the order one Voronoi diagram. Then you, for every cell, you you delete the point. And then you recompute the Voronoi diagram with that point missing, and then you point that point back because that point is going to then be inside the cells of everything else. Now, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so let me try and do it in the dual, in the Dewani, because it, it makes more sense there. So my algorithm is uh, start with a triangulation, uh, the Dewani triangulation. with your whatever point set you're given. And I took a nice regular point set to make it easy to draw the triangulation. Then, then uh, for every triangle, such as, uh, take, oops. What I'm, in, in general, what I'm going to have is uh, a triangle where each vertex is and labels. So I'm going to have uh, vertex with label set, labels alpha, Joined a beta. 
they can be joined by an edge if and only if the intersection of the labels and the union of the labels. So the um, each one of these is going to initially have k labels. The intersection has to have k minus one. The union has to have k plus one. Or things to possibly be joined by an edge. Okay. My triangulation is always going to have that property. That property is uh, trivially, tri trivially true if I start out initially by just giving everything a label, okay. uh, a, different, a distinct label. And now what I do is say, OK, uh, if I have a, uh, an edge, I'm going to construct a point on this edge by taking alpha union beta, which is now going to have k plus 1 things. And I'll put that at the centroid of these points. So labels are initial point, the names of initial points. I construct a new point by taking the lab, finding the label, and then take the centroid, the center of gravity of the points that go into the label, as my new point. What happens to my triangles is I do that as well. I get a point on each edge. But then what I do is I say, well, I'm going to take every triangle and I'm going to fill it in. Well, not, not quite true. Because um, I could have two types of things. In the initial labeling, I'll start with ABC and get something like AB, uh, BC, uh, and AC as a triangle. I'll construct that triangle. And I'll draw a shape. And then after that, I'm going to forget these old edges. But the other thing that happens later on is if I get a triangle AB, uh, BC, AC, if I do this construction here, well, notice that all, all three of these edges collapse down to ABC. And so this triangle collapses. And this is what happens. White triangles go to shaded triangles, which in the next step are going to collapse to points. Uh, when the white triangles here go to shaded triangles, there's some holes left over. I triangulate those holes using the Delaney triangulation. That's the dual of DT leads up there. And so I did that. Except I didn't use the Delaney triangulation. I just sort of arbitrarily triangulated here. Uh, that's my definition of centroid triangulations. I take the centroids of these points, I, I get these holes, I arbitrarily triangulate the holes. There's some sort of consistency going on. Because if I continue this uh, for a couple of steps, uh, each time I get holes that are simple polygons, and I can triangulate, I can continue this algorithm. I can prove that I can do it three, three times, uh, which is enough for me to get cubic splines and, 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 and everything I need. Uh, but I don't know that I can keep doing this beyond three, except that my program works, uh, my student's program works. It always runs, it always gives me valid triangulations. And there's something about, the, some sort of consistency that's going on that I'm, I haven't fully really understood. So my open problem is, how do we guarantee this algorithm works beyond what, All right. what fails? The collapse fails? What could fail? Uh, let me show you a, a, a picture of what, you know, where I'm trying to construct nasty examples. So here's my initial triangulation. It's obviously not the Bologna triangulation. Okay. DT, Lee's, DT Lee's algorithm says do the Bologna triangulation at every step. The proof that it works based, is based on global properties of this lifting, uh, the convex hull that you get from the lifting. And the proof that the AMTU stuff works is all using global properties of the you know. Well, I think that it just depends on local properties. You know, there's some, some of the In something nasty, if you had, you remember you had this regular mesh yeah. triangulated? But the thing there is that is not the unique uh, triangulation systems that you have before. Yeah. So I would, you know, I'm time. saying, don't even worry about the money triangulation. I'll just put any triangulation down there for your points. So and this works. algorithm still works for at least three steps, and I'm pretty sure it works forever. But, uh, so here, here's something that's completely non um, I, I'm not. I am going to assume general position uh, for the purpose of drawing these, these pictures, um, although we're, we're working out things in here. So I'm just to this one still looks like a regular triangulation, though, right? This one still looks regular, yeah. So what happens if you have something that can't be lifted uh, that's, that 
it's the regular it having technical meaning here? Yeah, regular it does. has a technical meaning is that it could be the lift, uh, uh, you could lift the points in, in the three dimensions and have the triangulation show up as the convex fall under, the, under some lifting. Yeah, so uh, so I haven't thought about that with respect to this triangulation. Alright, so I take each white triangle and I replace it by a shaded triangle. I'm going to do something that will help to fold in two to try my boundaries. Uh, and uh, in the first step, this is just take the midpoints of all edges because A, B, is, uh, 2 is just there. Uh, the next step, uh, well, then I throw away my original triangulation and these are the regions I have. If I triangulate these arbitrarily. Uh, um, and uh, and then I started throwing in labels so that I could keep track of things. So if this is point A and B, here's my point A, B, A, C, B, B, C. Uh, I'm going to then take every edge, including the edges that I added. And again, all of these white triangles are going to turn into shaded triangles, although the shaded triangles are going to collapse the points. Uh, and I get something that looks like this. Here's my point A, B, C, the centroid of those three points, is also the centroid of those original three points. Um, and, uh, and I triangulate arbitrarily and, and keep going. Uh, here's the next level. All right, that's my, that's my open problem. Um, I've got a few more minutes. Let me uh, tell you about why this uh, I should ask on this picture. Yeah. You only have two or three stages. We saw it for 10 or 20 or 30 stages. Or is yeah. that what triangle is growing as you go on? No, 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 it's certainly not. It's and in fact, I, I guess I don't understand the process well. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, eventually everything has to be the union of all the original labels I had. It's going to collapse at the same point. And just before that, it's probably going to be the convex hull of all of the you know things where you subtract uh, one label. So, so it eventually, uh, it eventually collapse down. And also notice that what happens is. Uh, while you're doing this, you know, some triangles actually emerge and turn into quadrilaterals, pentagons, and stuff like that. But so I guess I just missed the main point is... Well, no, well, you well, didn't well, miss the main point. That's the next slide. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so. so what... Okay, so, so there's this game that I want to know some things about. Why am I playing this game? That, that's really the main point. Uh, and um, I wanted to play this game because I wanted these properties for multivariate piece one. Um, I centroid triangulations. I can map the concepts. Uh, you had a third type of mapping. Sorry about that. Uh, I can map the concepts of uh, the one triangulations onto this sort of combinatorially defined centroid triangulations. The key thing that the two uses from the one triangulations to prove the last property of uh, polynomial reproducibility, the one that's the most important, is something about boundary matching that between the the Lewine triangulation of K minus 1 uh, and the Lewine triangulation of K, you, you have only a certain number of ways of mapping things together. And, um, and, and that can come locally from the centroid triangulation uh, instead of coming globally from properties of the higher order of the Lewine triangulation. Uh, so they satisfy this boundary matching property, which basically lets us prove the following theorem. Uh, that if we've got a sequence of configurations of, of these central triangulations, we start out with a triangulation, we do this operation of replacing uh, triangles by you know, with k labels on each vertex and the triangulation with k plus 1 labels on, on vertices that are derived in a certain way. Then, because they satisfy this boundary matching property, uh, the simplex lines associated with these configurations, these tuples that correspond to the label vertices of the triangulation, will reproduce all polynomials of degree k using the simplex lines uh, on those tuples as the basis. And the, uh, the form, you know, just you can write down something with a polar form that exactly matches the classic one of these one for the one for the one for the one one more thing of why you might want to do this. Um, so uh, we claim that uh, you know this sort of triangulation-based spline is able to uh, capture many of the existing uh, splines, even the splines that are defined in a regular basis. So box spline is one that's very heavily used in the theory of geometric design. Uh, 
purely defined on a regular grid. Uh, it's a it's a nice it's all, another one of Carl Ruhr's uh, scoring that's been made from the set a few years after the simplex scoring in '79. Uh, sort of took over from the simplex scoring because it's easier to work with. We claim that box splines are special central triangulation splines, um, which is sort of theoretically satisfying because it's evidence that these uh, centroid triangulations are a, a sort of general basis for bivariate splines. But it also has an important practical motivation. Going back to this uh, blending, where this teapot is defined by a regular box spline uh, for the body and another regular box spline for the, for the spout. And somehow you have to blend these things smoothly together. Well, one way to do that is to just say, okay, a box spline, I could go into the proof. The box spline is a polyhedral spline which you can cut up and deal with as uh, uh, simplex spines. But uh, uh, the base, uh, one of the basic box spines, so the, this word hello element is a quadratic box spline, uh, is something that you can make as an order to centroid triangulation if you do the right triangulation. So you get a regular grid, triangulate it this way, do two steps, uh, three steps of this algorithm, and you get this triangulation. Uh, and then you look at the pieces of this triangulation. You can actually uh, take this ZP element, which is really a, a cube uh, in four-dimensional space, decompose that cube into some simplices that then project down into uh, the simplices of this triangulation. And we reproduce exactly the ZP element over this mesh. What that means is, if I've got you know, patches, I've got a, you know, a rec, uh, so these regular patches that I need to join together here smoothly. So here I've you know, sort of made this hexagon. Uh, and I've, just made a partition of unity here by taking regular patches. Um, what do I have to do to do that? Well, because these things are really um, my centroid triangulations, all I have to do is say, you think you've got a box line, but really you've got a centroid triangulation. And I know what centroid triangulation it is, so I'll look at the edges of that centroid triangulation and then do my own centroid triangulation and fix up between the edges. So the blend between these two, I'll use my centroid triangulations, and I'll take your box lines, which give me this. I'll ignore what's happening sort of on the edges of your box lines and interpret them as my triangulation splines, fill in my own triangulation, which gives me this, and the two together give me this, which is my partition of unity, with smoothness guaranteed uh, just by the mathematics, it's not something that I have to enforce by carefully checking the merits. So, uh, a few other pictures of how you then throw in sharp features. You can add things to the triangulations to ensure that uh, certain edges are going to be respected in the triangulations and then do the interpolation uh, to force those edges uh, rather than these arbitrary triangulations. Another problem? Really, this one. Uh, show that this algorithm works in general uh, and doesn't just stop at cubic splines, which is enough for us, but much more satisfying than this. And uh, one point just decided that this done. Of a set of k points. Okay. 
those K points are the, are the points that you use to make the simplex lines. Okay, so those are points that playing, but you take those K points and then lifting them up in the third dimension or something? Uh, or so, so <coughs> that, that, uh, that, that That's the way to interpret what a simplex line is. Um, but, or you can just say, well, when I have those points, I can just write down a determinant expression. And that was me, I call it only. That's good. So those points tell you which basis elements you're going to use. Rather than using all k tuples, which is the same as the other. It sounds familiar, but you stood a half hour ago. It's not. I think Mike Niantu has also done some generalization of his original thing to non Delonian populations. So we're trying to find out from him of what, how closely related our generalizations are. Uh, yes. So, well, sorry, let me make sure I answer Yeah, I think question. you've answered the then, other question about the continuation. Someone asked what is the obstruction to continuing. I didn't understand the answer to that. Is it? So the, okay, what, so, what? so there's, yeah, this, this talk is difficult to give because there's a lot of pieces, none of which are hard. Uh, but uh, together, it's very easy to be lost. And I think the, um, the, the past this picture, the one sort of crucial piece is, uh, is the one of figuring out which k tuples you should use for, for, for the simplex ones. So k tuple of points in the plane is going to give you a polynomial by some magic that is named the simplex one. Uh, the simplex lines, you want enough of them to, to make a basis that can give you partition immunity, for one thing, uh, can give you polynomial reproducibility, is the main, main thing for, you want that for poly approximation and things like that. Uh, you can certainly get a basis by taking all k tools. Uh, that's, that's enough. In fact, it's way too much, and you get a redundant basis, and you'd like something that has less redundancy. So uh, the Amtu's observation was that the one configurations, they give you k tuples. You say, I want all circles that have k minus, uh, well, k minus one, I want, I want the order k minus one to one in triangulation. Uh, they, they'll give you k tuples. Uh, and those k tuples are enough uh, to give you the polynomial reproducibility using global arguments about the lifting of this Delonian triangulation. The global arguments aren't really necessary. There's this local argument that if this technique works of, of centroid triangulations, the only thing of obstruction to the centroid triangulations is something of, uh, as you do this procedure, the holes that you get, are they, uh, are they some polygons? And so we come very much back to the question or, or not, self, not boundaries with self intersections. It's kind of, kind of boundaries self intersections. And, uh, I don't and understand this, how that's even possible. I thought that they were bounded by the shaded triangles, which are disjoint. Yeah. They all are centers of disjoint triangles. So yeah. what's left over is the complement of a bunch of triangles. So that's right. How can it not be uh, bounded by a polygon? Well, because. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's certainly bounded by polygons. It's whether the boundaries of these polygons are crossing this world. So, so these are the sort of polygons you get. Um, so you draw a picture of a polygon which is not acceptable on the blackboard. Sure. Yeah, I thought this was very neat. I, I didn't like using the projection things. I like drawing on my transparency. I didn't know you could draw on the projection. Uh, so, so I can, I can make uh, collections of triangles. This triangle that hooks over overlaps another triangle. There's nothing in this procedure that guarantees that directly. Uh, that, that that doesn't happen. So I get, you know, if I look at what's going on around this vertex. Uh, well, what's going on is. I'm, so I don't understand the poking, maybe the. Yeah. So, so what goes on around this vertex is I'm basically taking a copy of, of the link uh, around this vertex. If I look at the white triangles around this vertex, we 
the shaded triangles are going to collapse to points. These, these triangles um, that are in white, so this edge, for example, is going to take whatever label is here, add the, add the uh, take the union with this vertex here, uh, which is labeled BC. This has to have either B or C present. It's actually going to have C present. It's on a hole that has a meaning and C present. So this is going to add B to the label and sort of shift this all over so that and scale it a little bit so that what I get as my hole, the next one is going to be something like this. Okay, so that makes that easier going on. Yep. You're just taking each white triangle and replacing it by a central triangle. <coughs> That's right. Uh, the labeling, I guess, is different. So uh, if I were just saying, always introduce the midpoints, yes. then it would be something much easier. That's why I guess what I thought yeah. you were saying, yeah. I got five meters. Yeah, and it's, it's difficult. It's, you know, that's why the first couple of steps you can prove things about, because you know, it's very easy to you know, take uh, control of it. You know, things are just midpoints. Here is exactly that, that figure that we're going to go. Sorry, I went too far. Here is that figure that uh, you know, said was going to be. So I had uh, two questions. Yes. One is, um, so if you were always using regular triangulations, then you know you'd have some altitudes you could lift to. So maybe that would satisfy them. You know, if you're always using regular triangulations. Um, well, okay, but it depends how you use regular triangulations. If you use regular triangulations by saying I've got some convex surface that I'm lifting everything to, and as I continue I'm going to keep lifting things to the same surface. Uh, that is, I, I lift the original points and then work from there. Yeah, I don't think that's basically that... like doing the line. Yeah, I don't but think that'll work. I'm yeah. lifting uh, centroids in a sense in a way that's not guaranteeing that my lift over in one region is consistent with my lift over in the other region, even though these things are linked somehow. They're linked by being in the same level so. They might each lift, lift to some convex kind of surface, but they're not, the surface won't be consistent. That's right. And so if I can't use global consistency properties, then the lift is not going to come. That's what you know, we've seen. And there's got to be something you know, sort of more combinatorial consistency or something don't quite understand. My, my other could question. Be some notion of convexity, but which allows immersions of self-intersecting convex <laughs> surfaces. There is such a thing. Um, no. Locally convex, but but, but my other question is related, and that's um, so. What did it get you by relaxing the by not using Delaunay at every step? Oh, it gave me things like I could reproduce the box lines by using uh, my favorite triangulation for for the. Um, when I want to use this for terrain uh, cartographic mapping, um, I want to be able to uh, use long scaling elements you know, in places where the uh, gradient is uh, uh, yes. Data okay, dependent cool. triangulation yeah. goes to yeah. data dependent spline construction. So. Uh, yeah. Steve. Um, so, can you use these uh, as bases for finite element methods? I haven't tried yet. Um, uh, because you know there's a big issue. So if you're trying to solve, say, the biharmonic equation, then you need a basis with uh, continuous derivatives at the boundaries of the elements. And so these are sort of much harder to draw than the usual finite element mm -hmm. spaces. Yeah, I mean, it would seem, it would seem, I would seem. I'll talk to you more about this. Any other questions? Thanks. 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 Thanks.